Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my next interview is with Ilan Ziv, and we talk about his new film, An Eye for an Eye, which just recently opened in New York and coming to Toronto in the very near future. We talk about hate, and, and we talk about racism and forgiveness, and, 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 and why the future may not necessarily be so bright, and why the media, in, in his mind, drives this dialogue and this conversation and this rhetoric about hate forward. We talk about why we don't really choose evil. It kind of, in a sense, almost uh, chooses us. And, 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 and Alan talks a lot about, about mirrors, of, of uh, distorted mirrors of our society, and that certainly comes up in this film. It's, a, it's an unsettling film, and yet it's also incredibly positive. It's about Mark, Mark Stroman. He's the man who, who murdered uh, several people after 9-11 many years ago and ultimately was um, executed on death row, and it tells a story of, of, of revenge. It tells a story of forgiveness and, and relationship and as Mar- uh, as Elan says, uh, this is a story about his friendship with Mark and, and what happens over a 10-year period. You need to see this film. Uh, and I'm hoping you feel that like you need to hear this conversation with Alan and I. It's coming right up. Uh, DavidPeckLive.com for more information about my speaking, podcasting, and writing. Real Changes Incremental is there for the taking. Uh, Rabble.ca for more interviews. And uh, check them out as well online. Coming right up, Ilan Ziv, uh, as we talk about his film, An Eye for an Eye. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We are joined by a very special guest here today uh, from New York City, uh, Ilan Ziv. He's a documentarian filmmaker. He is, um, well, I think we're going to find out he's quite a conversationalist as well and a very passionate guy. Ilan, thank you so much for uh, taking the time uh, to join us today on Face to Face. Thank you for uh, inviting me. So congratula- congratulations on the film. Uh, the film is An Eye for an Eye. Uh, a story of revenge, change, and forgiveness. Um, the the um, uh, quite a film, Elan. Uh, it so many things to talk about, so many questions, so many themes and metaphors and and opportunities. You know, the splash and r- ripple effect here. It, 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 the potential for it is huge. Tell tell the audience because they probably haven't seen the film. Uh, film opens uh, tomorrow in New York, opening in Toronto, and uh, very soon in Quebec in the next day or so. Tell us a little bit about the story, your story, Mark, race, and so on. Well, I uh, I heard about. I mean, it's a very long story how I got into it, but the short version of it is I heard about a story which never really made it nationally at the time, was about Texas' first hate crime after September 11. And it involved a guy by the name of Mark Stroman, whom the press described as a supremacist, racist, white. Some people said he belonged to the Aryan Brotherhood, who, as a, what he claimed was the revenge of September 11, went out and shot people whom he thought was from the Middle East. And... They ended up being immigrants from East Asia. He killed uh, on September 17. He killed on September 15. He killed uh, Wakil Hassan, a Pakistani man, in a convenience store at a gas station. On September 22, if I don't I forget, he wounded a young man from Bangladesh, Rais Bahuyan. And then on October 7, he killed a Hindu. Uh, an immigrant from India, who um, Vadoshev Patel, he was captured after that murder because he was uh, caught on camera. But he was caught on camera as he was shooting Vadoshev, Mr. Patel. He was caught on camera saying, uh, "You know, open the cash register, open the cash register." And on that basis, he was. The prosecution asked for a death penalty because in Texas it's it's 
supposed to be called capital murder. So they were not going to try for the first, for the other murder and the wounding of Reis Bahuyan, but they were going to seek the death penalty for uh, for the, the so-called robbery because capital murder is you commit a felony, you commit a murder during another felony. And in their logic, the, the, the principal felony was robbery, which gun wrong and he was killed he killed the guy during See, the robbery it, Elan, Elan, it seems like such a it seems like such a crazy distinction you know as as you said in their logic um let's 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 come back to that in a second tell tell me a little so if 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 an interviewer like myself says Elan, tell me tell me what this movie is about you know it's the tagline is the logline is a story of revenge change and forgiveness how do you kind of capture it because it touches on so many uh, uh, because the story, the story. So f- the first part is the revenge, which means who is this guy and what physically he did and what he claims he did it. The story of change is him changing on death row over the seven years that I accompanied him, and the story of forgiveness is because towards the end, uh, two months before the execution, Reis Bahuyan his only surviving victim, began a public and a legal campaign to try to spare Mark from the death chamber. So those are the three sort of headlines for the three part of the story. However, as you indicated, it has many more layers than that, because I always consider that story illustrative of, you know, deeper and bigger uh, issues. So it's not just the mechanism of revenge change because I do believe it symbolized larger aspect of society that's what I wanted to show well the you know as as you say the bigger bigger picture bigger themes greater story the divisive kind of rhetoric that's going on politically right now with you know the Trump campaign and 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 the way the media is covering what's happening in the US and us Canadians you know of course uh, these things are going on here in Canada as well they're going around uh, on around the world but it seems right now there's this um, I don't know this 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 uh, um, almost uh, celebration of it in a way through the media does that make, does that make sense uh, I mean I think it, it, I wouldn't call it celebration, but the media shows it's it's not weaknesses. It's it's Achilles heel. I mean, the mm. media is ultimately looking for audience and rating, and that's what drives it. And if it could get rating by covering Trump twenty four seven, it will. If it get rating by covering Trump's sex life. So that's just, I think it's wrong to think the media is, at least in my opinion, that the media is biased. The media is driven by rating, and it's driven by voracious appetite for, for rating, and that's really what drives it. So it will be against Trump if it pays. It will be for Trump if it pays. Right, right. It, it will be for for against anything that brings audience. So, and again, when, when in the firm... Tom Boston says the media drives hate. I do believe the media drives hate, but not because the media is made out of hateful people. Right. It drives hate because after September 11, hate brought audiences. So you could celebrate revenge of September 11 and the going to war in Afghanistan. If tomorrow something else will happen, the media will be against hate because the audience is disillusioned with hate. So. What I'm saying is there's a dialectic with the audience because the media is, is just listening to what he consider echoes in the population and it plays on them and it magnifies them. You say, so Elan, in the you know the, the the dialectic, you know, almost the dialectic of the conversation or of the of the the hate filled rhetoric. Do you do you know you, in the film you certainly lay out a story that suggests that Mark's past. Uh, his upbringing, the the abuse, the emotional trauma, and so on and so on that he suffered as a kid, um, as a young boy and a young man, and so on, played a huge role in in the guy, in the man, in the person that he became. Do you, after having spent so much time with him and, and so intimately connected to this project, do you believe that hate is something we learn entirely, or is it is it is it that polarized? I think I think with Mark. 
which that's sort of the only guy I can talk to right. in depth. Uh, I think with Mark, it's two issues. I think Mark was top hate. Mark was, was spanked, it's not in the film, but he was spanked when he played with a black friend. Uh, Mark was taught racism at home from a very young age. So Mark, in that sense, was taught hate. Mark was conditioned to hate because of the hateful environment that he grew up. You know, the lack of self-confidence, the, the abuse, the you know, putting him down. His mother told him that he was she was a twenty-five dollars short of an abortion, and that's the reason why he was born. Wow. So when you're born with that Horrible. background, uh, hate becomes the way you deal with the universe, uh, because the universe is not a nice place. The universe is really hateful, and so it's a combination of quote unquote being taught hate and grew to hate. And I think when society doesn't intervene early enough and doesn't intervene forcefully enough, uh, then the hate gets solidified and, and layers of layers. And when you're being thrown to, uh, at, at the age of 12 to, uh, you know, kids home, which in Texas is sort of, you know, me, you know, a penitentiary for youth, uh, and you get very little corrective treatment, uh, you come out of it even a more of a criminal, and then you commit another felony like trying to rob, and you go to prison and you come out of it a hard, a more hardened criminal. So I don't know if you've seen the the series on HBO, the night I think it was the night off. No, I haven't. Uh, which was about I think it probably played in Canada too. It's very captivating. It's about a mur sort of a detective kind of theory, looking at a murder. But he, the mystery is this young Pakistani immigrant, the son of immigrants, who commit, he doesn't commit a murder, but there's no explanation for the body of the woman slashed. And he goes to Rikers Island waiting for his trial. And the film actually spends a lot of time in Rikers Island. And one of the gang leaders in, in the jail tell him, I like you, we're going to make you a good criminal. And at the end of the, the film, you don't get, he's basically dismissed because the jury was hung, uh, but he, he came out a criminal. He's already a, mm. a cocaine and heroin addict. He saw way too much more than normal people should have seen. He was participating in violence in jail, and he comes out, a, you know, potentially a future hardened criminal. So there's a lot to be said about that trajectory that once you have you are you have that at home you start committing small violation you're being thrown to different level of penitentiary you come out a hard criminal it, so it's, in that it's sense, mark was in elan it's surprising to me you know the prosecutor that that you show who's a, a man of uh, clearly a man of faith uh, of a particular sort and and he says that uh, you know we choose we uh, we choose evil we choose evil we choose evil and and that, is it is it that, is it as black and white as that for you no, I mean, I asked him that because he said it, and I'm very glad that I asked him, and I'm very glad that he replied, because I wanted to show, in my opinion, a profoundly erroneous way of looking at it, as if we are, which means the whole basis of that that statement is that we are somehow rational human beings. We make choices every day, every hour. Some choices are good, and some choices are bad, and we are punished. Now... In principle, yes. In reality, it's never the case, mm. which means we are basically victims of a lot of things. We are victims of our psychology. We are victims of our past traumas. We are, we are victims of uh, education. We are victims of destroyed homes. We are victims of many, many things. So that does not necessarily justify crime or an excuse for crime, but it's a very simplistic way of looking at evil as if it's something that we choose. If you look at evil as something that I was conditioned to, or I was driven to, or I did, that may give you a whole different way of looking at how do I treat it. And again, it's not about the punishment, it's about how, because if you treat me as somebody who chose evil, then you should you should eliminate me because it's a horrible thing to choose him. So, so in a so in a sense, for you, I mean, I, I, I mean, this is my take at least. For, for you, this isn't 
I mean, obviously Mark is responsible or Mark was responsible uh, for the way he reacts, the way he behaves, etc. But in a sense, are you not saying with eye for an eye that, you know, we're all culpable. We're, we're all in this together. We, we all play a role uh, of I mean, one if, kind if, or another. If we understand that, that Mark is a distorted mirror of our society and in many ways he reflects toward his tormented mind at the, at, at the time of the crime, our problems and our wrong attitude, then you get a much more holistic way to look at it. And if you look at it holistically, again, it's not about saying to Mark, okay, we understand, go home for free. Because even in our deepest conversation over the seven years, I always told Mark that I don't think he should get out of prison, which means you have to pay for what you've done. I don't think you should be executed, but I do think that you have to pay because otherwise we cannot run a society and you cannot justify it for the victim. So I I always say that Mark, you know, you should be – you know, in prison without parole, at least for the next 20 or 30 years, and maybe towards the end of your life, if you show that you've changed so much, maybe, you know, there's a room for parole, but not uh, not now. So I, everything I say is qualified by the fact that I don't think Mark should have been forgiven for what if he did, he shouldn't be killed for what he did, but he shouldn't have been forgiven, he should have paid a punishment. However, if I was understanding the complexity of his crime and the complexity of his personality, maybe I could have a prison system that tried to address it, not to lock him 23 hours a day and basically treat him like an animal and then get rid of him, of him like an animal, but a, a correctional facility which is trying to so-called correct while incarceration. Because that many things that Mark, Mark was a very, very bright man. Uh, Mark could have finished high school and university in uh, in prison. Mark could have done a lot of things in prison. So if you look at Mark, but if he chose evil, according to the prosecutor, then he's an evil man. Evil men we try to get rid of. We don't like them in our well, society. Ilan, at the at the beginning yeah. of at the beginning of the film, um, much like Werner Herzog, I, I couldn't help but be reminded uh, of, of of some of the narration in his films, and I so appreciated this about your film and, and how you inserted yourself into it. Uh, in, in a very interesting and reflective and relational way, you know, you say this is the story of our friendship. Um, is Mark? Did Mark become? Um, how do I say this? Did Mark become a, a better man, a different man? A, a richer man as a result of the friendship that he had with you, as a result of the questions you asked him, of the, as the result of the 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 uh, the intimacy that you guys developed together as friends. I co- yeah, yeah, I contribute to that. I will not claim. A to- First of all, Mark became a better man because he wanted to become a better man. So Mark had a self awareness process. Mm, right. So I don't believe. Anybody change anybody. I believe we contribute to each other via dialogue and interaction. So I did contribute to him. I came in the right moment in his life. And very soon, a few years later, I was surrounded by many other people who contributed too. So there was eventually a group of us who contributed to Mark. And pro- and to be honest, we didn't even prod him. I never talked to Mark about changing. I never talked to Mark right. about the need to change. I never uttered the word change in any dialogue that we had over the seven years. I don't think anybody else did. However, we we provided two things. We provided a positive role model. Right. And we provided something which was very rare at the beginning for me even to acknowledge it. We provided support and love and accepting is good and is is bad and accepting him as he was. And I think that was a huge impetus for him. And he even said it in the interview. So I think all of that contributed to him wanting to change. And but he did the heavy lifting himself. Did you ever did you ever did you ever see aspects of yourself in in Mark in a sense? And I guess the question I'm really asking you is are are we all in some way capable of this kind of hate, of this kind of behavior? That was the opening premise for me to go and see him. The opening premise for me, I was in Israel in military service for three and a half years. I participated in combat. I was in the October war for three weeks and then was mobilized for six months later. So, and I was, I participated in combat. So for me 
killing and witnessing killing was not an alien thing. I, again, you can say that, oh, but a war is a different thing. At the end of the day, on an individual basis, it's not that different, which means the war provides you a narrative that allows you to do things that you don't do when you take the metro in, in Toronto mm. to work. Uh, so you do things that you're not normally supposed to do. You're punished for doing. Uh, but a, a war and a military give you a narrative to justify. Well, Mark got created his own narrative, which was false and, and misleading. But he created the narrative that he wanted revenge, which was as good a narrative as a war is, beside the fact that society didn't accept it. And society doesn't accept those narratives. Society accepts for me a collective narrative. So if I move to Canada and I join the Canadian military and I send to Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, society hails me as a hero and, and uh, says to me, go and kick some ass, you know, and go and, and protect democracy by killing the bad guys. So it's a narrative. It's nothing more than a so, narrative. So, but so, it's society, societal accepted. And let me just say one yeah, more thing yeah, go. about this thing, if I may. Yes, please. Uh, hear my rambling for another 20 seconds, and I'll get to my point. <laughs> uh, because, and for Mark, it, because I know I told it full, for Mark, it's very important, and it, then it was proven wrong. It was at the beginning the impetus was I kill and people say good we need to kill those bastards and it, it really happened with the murder of the Pakistani men because the murder of the Pakistani men I can tell you now it didn't start because he was roaming around and looking to kill Pakistani men he was looking for trouble he was boiling with hate rage whatever and he was basically a ticking bomb waiting to explode. So, but the Pakistani man, which nobody knows that I'm giving you that little scoop, is the Pakistani man, basically he called in for cheeseburger, two cheeseburger, and he, because he was working late, and he came into that, you know, little convenience store, and the cheeseburger were not ready. And Mark exploded and shot the guy, after he forced him to come out of the plastic, the secure area, and cook him cheeseburger, and he shot him. So it started with cheeseburger, not about September 11. Now wait, then he goes to the bar, right? And the day after, and in the bar, all of his buddies, not knowing that Mark did anything, all of his buddies, the redneck, you know, racist, white supremacists, whatever you want to call them, uh, you know, chilling in the bar and they say we got one did you hear we got one and this is where you know it clicks in his mind wow so like i'm a good guy right you know? right, I, right i'm doing it for a cause i'm not just a well guy, he says a lost guy exploding himself he, and creating this damage he says he says in the film that you know this was an act of war i'm i'm not a i'm not a serial killer this is an act of war um, exactly. That's what that's what the narrative that had to be destroyed yes. through the seven years that he had to destroy and dismantle himself to see how false it was and how misleading it was. And by the by the way, to, in the last couple of years, he was not using it anymore because he realized how false the narrative. But at the beginning, that's what sustained the murders. I'm not doing it by myself. I'm doing it for a cause. So, Ilan, tell me tell me about the forgiveness. Tell me about about you know, so many different levels of forgiveness going on in this film. I, I can't even begin to, to really chat about it in a, in a substantive way. But but tell us a little bit about Rai uh, Bahayan, uh, the Bangladeshi man who, who survived Mark's shooting. Uh, two, two shots, I believe, to, 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 uh, that he survived. Who then, goes, who then goes on to not only uh, forgive him, but to create a mandate for himself and for others uh, about social change, about the death penalty, uh, creates a campaign online. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that, about that, that narrative. Well, I mean, and how, that, how does that narrative develop versus a one fed with hate? Develop, I mean, that narrative develop and race is the best to talk about it. That narrative developed because race were undergoing his own 
process too right. in those years. So Mark is in prison, being visited initially by people like me, then by many others, getting pen pals from all over the world, and he's on a, on a road to another phase. Meanwhile, you have Raiz, who was very... Raiz was thrown by this attack, suffered very badly, not only physically, he basically, he lost, he won a green card by uh, a lottery that was lost because he couldn't go to Bangladesh to reclaim the green card. He is going for different eye op operation and uh, treatment in Dallas. He can't work, so he's getting more and more into debt. He doesn't have any place to stay. He sleeps on friend's floor. Uh, he, he, because he doesn't have any insurance, he ends up owing, owing dozens of thousands of dollars wow. of, of uh, medical bills. So he's basically a bankrupt. And this is where I met him. So when I met him, he, he was in 204, he was clawing out of that hole. He got a job. Uh, he, he succeeded to get some kind of a grant from a victim organization to get the, de the debt of the hospital being taken care of. He started to work as a waiter in a restaurant uh, in Olive Garden in Dallas, and he's working in the restaurant as a waiter, but he's working and he's making income, and he still cannot drive because he couldn't get a driving license because I, one eye was declared blind, and I think he semi driving illegally by a car donated to him. Because in Dallas, it's very difficult to be without a car. So he's trying to get his medical things so he can get a driver license officially. He's got a loan car. The dad is more or less taken care of, and he's making some kind of a living. And he wants to go to, um, to night school to study computer engineering, which when he told me that in 204, it sounded like a fantasy, Right. frankly. Not totally a fantasy, and but he does go to, to night school and he does end up uh, finishing and he does get a job in, in computer engineering and he actually makes a good living because he, he gets a job at a company that manages big websites like American Airlines and other airlines and he's become a, a, team, a head of a team and he runs around it, Europe it, because the team is in Europe and the, it's and the a, Philippines. It, it, it really is a remark a remarkable story. I mean, near the end of the film, he talks about how, you know, this, this actually did sort of destroy his life, and yet it becomes apparently, no, he's, you know. No, he, he, did, he rebuilt his life, and the more, and two things are, are important, he goes in 209 to Mecca, uh, because he's, he was always a devout man, and he goes to Mecca with his mom, which is kind of a very transformational experience because his family is in Bangladesh, you know, his mom is in Bangladesh. He, he takes his mom. He has enough money now to fly her and to stay in Saudi Arabia for a month through Holy Pilgrimage with his mom. Uh, he's now, you know, and he, and he got his citizenship. So he's an American citizen. So suddenly he has the means, uh, the, the spiritual commitment getting deepened. And uh, he goes through these transformational experiences in Mecca. And then coming out of it is kind of a, a guy that says, now it's my time to pay back uh, to my fortune because I was... I was uh, Elan, from Elan, yeah. Elan, he said he said in the film my uh, quote the quote is uh, after his visit and and the time and I guess this change that he went through he said my heart was softer than ever what a, what right. a, what a beautiful what a beautiful way to, to to lay it out so then he starts out of these pure motives he starts what can he do but by that time you see this is why it's so fascinating and why this film is for me was kind of unique because i never it ha doesn't happen in your life a few times like this is because i wanted so he, he okay so he, this is raised now we you know the people goes back to mark now mark is i'm facing sort of which is we didn't talk about it but okay so now i i'm i lost my media credential because I promised Mark that I would be a witness to his execution, so I've been put on his friend list. A friend, which is a word that, at those years, two or five, was kind of alarming. Why am I, who am I a friend of? Serial right, right. killer, you know? So, I, I'm working through this, why did I even agree to, uh, 
to witness his execution, I'm trying to understand what is happening between me and Mark and this relationship. I'm kind of drawn into the guy more because I visited him on death row without a camera and we have very frank conversation. So out of all of that, I come up with the ideas, listen, I'm not going to finish the film before at least you're going to have an execution date. So, but I want to do something. So I come up with the idea of a blog. And the blog is getting more and more popular because, you know, a few hundred people and eventually at the end, a few thousand people are reading it on a weekly basis when he, when he publishes it. Now, I did not know that one of the readers was Raiz. So Raiz gets sort of a window into Mark Changes. So when Raiz is ready a year later, in 2009, after reading Mark blog and after going through his own process, he says, hey, why don't I try to save this guy because that's my interpretation of Islam, that I forgive him. And therefore, and racist, by the way, is acting on a very, on, on stuff that we don't have in our Western penal system. Right, right. Because in, in the so-called barbaric in a state which support execution, like Iran, Saudi Arabia, etc., they might be barbaric on one side, but they're much more advanced than us on another because they have the capacity for the victim to forgive. And if the victim forgives, you don't execute the guy. Right. And so race is kind of, I wouldn't say misplaced because it has a negative connotation, but it brings the concept from Islam into a Western legal system. Hey, I forgive, you can't kill him anymore. Because I forgive him. You know, so, yeah. yeah, no, Alan, I was just going to say, I really, it truly is a remarkable film and a remarkable story in the sense of the, the layers that you, you, you pretty much put out there for, for all of us, not only to see, I guess, but our responsibility now in some ways, I would like to think our obligation towards others, towards our culture, towards our community and globe and so on is to get involved, is to, is to have you know, to, to ask some of these questions, to go a little deeper. And and, and, and I'm not going to talk about it because I hope uh, all of our listeners are going to see the film. But the way you end the film is just such a, a compelling statement about, um, I don't know, about hope, I guess. And, and you know, you talked about, about the narrative that we all develop and we all have our own. And you must, you must be absolutely stunned as you've been wait, making this film, watching things unfold in the U.S. with regard to the election, uh, speaking of narratives, and, and, and how, how poignant and timely your film really is. No, but, but the interesting thing is that when Mark told me those lines, which are ending the film, which was 2011, it sounded like for me, because I knew the intimacy of Mark, and I knew what a profound statement for him to say that. So I was like a proud daddy that, wow, he really, really transformed and changed. So I, I was, ve- but the poignancy of that statement was very global. Mm, and yes. I mean, don't forget it, before the Paris attack, before the attacks in America, because in America, you had only the Boston Marathon by then, I think, and you didn't have anything of, of so before San Bernardino, before before the, the candidacy of, of Donald Trump, before the rise of anti-Islam in an organized. So it didn't. It's not a great, wonderful statement from somebody that I'm so proud that he did it, but there was no threat of that kind of thing. Now there is a threat. So I didn't. I to be honest, I didn't. I understood the depth of the statement. Right. I didn't understand its potency. And now when we live through these times all over the world, not only in the US, I see wow. So it was so much more it's so much more pointed now than it was for me in two thousand eleven. Uh, because in two thousand eleven we've had this big trauma of you know, of uh, September 11th, the attack, in the invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan. We were beyond all of that, supposedly. Yeah, supposedly, you know, yes. Little, little that I knew, a little that I understood what I understand now. So Mark's statement, in that sense, was, for me now, is almost prophetic rather than just yes. you know, a, a very meaningful statement because, boy, we got to be careful. Elon, Elon. Sadly, we've got to we've got to wrap this up here in a minute. Maybe we can do a part two in the future. I would love to do that, and and maybe even get Rice on the phone as well and talk more about his own story. But you know, I mean, I think I know the answer to this question to some degree. 
but I would love to hear your comments, you know, about the future based on this this story that you've developed based on the the lives that you've been able to shine this light into and you know what, what kind of insights and wisdom i mean you clearly sound like a hopeful guy and clearly i think the the film is ultimately at the core incredibly hopeful what, what where where are we heading <laughs> well like, what do you this think was, this was this was the wrong question to ask uh and i'll explain to you very succinctly and shortly why because i'm doing a four-part series on the history of the war on terror mm. for, also for canadian i mean radio canada and for nice. in france so i've been the last couple of years i've been delving in all this uh interviewing uh, high-level politician and high-level security guys and all that so the, the short answer is i'm very pessimistic uh, i'm i'm it's a hope because as long as there's a human spirit and human capacity of change, there is hope. But we have to work very, very hard yes. to change the pessimistic future that I see. So you, it starts by defeating Donald Trump, which is really just the first step. And it starts by not electing Marie Le Pen in, in France. And it's starting by trying to rectify uh, the, the damage done by Brexit, and it started by millions of things. But there's a huge lifting to be done because we're heading into very dark times, mm. and I don't think we understand the, the, fully the danger that we are heading into. That's part of the series to show. So, Mark is a hopeful message, and it's some, something that I cling, you know, personally a lot <laughs> because of this capacity of change and and also the danger of stereotyping and how we should fight stereotyping. But we got to do a lot of fighting and a lot of work uh, to convince a lot of people that, you know, eye for an eye, it's a dead end. And and the other end, the other road, you know, whatever political configuration we fight for it, it's the only hope for survival of us as a society. No, because eye for an eye leads to destruction, and Mark is a tiny symbol of the tiny the, the damage, the few lives that he destroyed. But we have the capacity to do a much bigger damage in a collective eye for an eye. Look at what we did in Iraq, and we look what he did in Afghanistan, and look what you know. So the potential, and we look what we can do in our own societies. Uh, damage that we can do in our society. So the danger of eye for an eye for me has now become a huge danger. And the message of race and the message of victims who forgive is a very uplifting message. But we got to really convince other people that it's not just naive and it's not just, you know, daydreaming, that it's very practical. Because well, I for I will kill us all. I think I think you've you've laid it out really well for for everyone to see. It's a compelling story. I, I love the fact that there is hope there. That yes, it's a dark tale. It's it's difficult to watch at points, but but I really appreciate it. And again, congratulations on and your opening uh, tomorrow in New York, Toronto next week. Uh, we've been talking with Alain Ziv. An eye for an eye is the film, a story of revenge, change, and forgiveness. Uh, please do what you can to get out to see the film. Alain, thank you so much time for your uh, thank, oh, thank you so you. much for your time. Thank and generosity today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.